So welcome everyone to the uh, retirement planning webinar. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we, I've got uh, Nathan Buttergeek, the Chief Member Officer, but uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, just a quick disclaimer before we get into the main content that tonight's advice is advice of a general nature and um, if you would like uh, sp and, and seek personal advice before making any decisions, but if you would like specific advice, the way that we um, facilitate that at uh, Cornerstone Wealth is have you complete a questionnaire first, then we meet for an initial consultation where we would um, learn more about your goals, um, understand your current situation, and then talk through the pros and cons of the range of options available to you. Um, if it's warranted, we would go to the next stage where we would prepare written advice for you, help you implement it and provide ongoing advice. But you can take the process as far as you need to or want to or get value from. Um, so tonight we're talking about retirement planning and uh, the emotional phases of retirement. And um, this uh, chart has really uh, come out of a, a survey, that, survey that was actually done uh, and, uh, over 10 years ago in the United States and it was trying to understand the emotional phases of retirement. So what's the emotions that you go through as you start to prepare and think about retirement? And the first one is, they titled the imagination phase where it's between sort of 15 years out from retirement and five years out from retirement. You start to imagine um, what retirement might look like and the potential that you might have to retire or that you might want to be uh, retiring. And, um, but you haven't given much thought to it. You haven't worked out how much you need to retire. Um, you, you haven't um, you know, work, worked out exactly when that might be. Um, and so it's, it's really just the formation of it. Um, it's really valuable at that point in time to uh, seek some advice because there's generally lots of strategies that are available to assist you when you've got it. Uh, a lot of time frame, particularly if you're 15 years out from retirement, uh, to put a good plan in place. Uh, and in particular, um, it might be towards, if you're getting close to five years in, it might be towards the, uh, after the peak of the high cost or high expenditure period where you might have uh, no longer got kids uh, going through schooling or um, at home, etc., and that you can start to vamp up some savings. The hesitation stage was a stage that they um, identified mainly around the um, global financial crisis where people were approaching retirement. They might have been two to five years out from re retirement, but they, um, with the drop in markets, they actually worked out that, oh, hang on, I don't know whether I'm ready anymore. I had a target. I'd actually thought about what when I was going to retire, how much money I was going to have for retirement, but then they hesitated because their, their um, uh, resources might have been depleted during that uh, global financial crisis. And so they actually hesitated and, and stopped and kept on working. And that was actually a wise thing to do for a lot of people because it meant that they were able to um, not deplete their savings, work through them, and then get their retirement goals back on track uh, afterwards. So that was sort of a, a global financial crisis um, uh, situation. Uh, the anticipation phase is where you've started to really um, uh, uh, have a date that you might retire. And, and when we're talking about retirement, uh, from a Christian perspective, um, there's not actually retirement isn't a word that appears in the Bible. In, in fact, they talk about um, as you get older, not able to do the physical work, you move into um, assisting and helping people. So it's not um, as with other advice and um, not doing the physical work, but actually using your knowledge to help others. So uh, whilst we talk about retirement, it's more so the financial um, term used uh, that you're no longer going to be, um, uh, you, you might not be um, employed uh, and gaining um, income, uh, finan uh, financial reward for what you're doing. Uh, but the anticipation phase, a couple of years out, um, generally, you've got your plans in place, you know not what you need to live on, um, you're working towards those saving goals and you, and you've, um, uh, you know, understand what you need to achieve and when it's going to happen. Uh, the realisation, uh, and then you actually uh, finish up, and this might be part-time, it might, might be full-time, um, but it's actually finishing this the full-time role that you're, you're potentially currently doing. Um, 
the realization phase, and this is an interesting one because often people think that it's going to be this wonderful uh, period where you retire and life's going to be wonderful, you do lots of leisure activity, um, but it actually can be quite tough, particularly for men and for men that have gone from full-time work to full-time retirement, so um, that can sometimes have some generally negative um, outcomes. It can be quite a difficult period transitioning, uh, so it's not all upside, um, but uh, yeah, the key there is to make sure that you actually are engaged um, and you do plan your time and it's not just doing uh, social activities. I find with the clients that I help through this process and I'm focusing on the financial but I'm quite interested in the non-financial outcomes is that people who retire and retire from uh, full-time work to um, uh, to no paid work, they generally take between 12 and 18 months before they've sort of recuperated, they've uh, focused on all those projects that they've had on the go, um, whether it's in the garden, around the house, or a trip, or a holiday. After six to 18 months, they really want to start to re-engage again, and whether that's in paid employment or volunteer work or other things, um, that's where that realisation phase sort of starts to come to an end, and then you start to re reorientate your, your life, um, and so you might have a portfolio of things that you're doing ranging from family engagement to um, uh, might be some still some paid work uh, to volunteer work travel uh, and leisure so it ends up being a uh, reorient reorientating your uh, life um, during that year to um, 15 years post retirement and then the reconciliation phase is where you start to uh, think about your legacy and um, and some of, I guess, the, the other things that are sometimes start to happen in that uh, phase is you start to use, lose some of your network through, um, uh, through people dying. Um, and it's, that's what they call it, the, I guess, the reconciliation um, stage. They're the phases of retirement. And each of those phases, there's things that you can focus on from a um, financial perspective. But the key from our point here is to... Um, what you can do in preparation and I guess in the first year of retirement, all those um, financial uh, concerns. Just one other thing to uh, factor in, I know I mentioned in that um, uh, realisation phase, that uh, one to five years post-retirement, um, the, the fact that we've sort of changed the way that we uh, live now. Um, and, and this chart, this is from, uh, was derived from the United Nations, United Nations and KPMG, but it just shows the difference in lifestyle and life expectancy over the last 80 years. And so if you look at 1928, then you would have childhood up until your teens, and then you might start full-time work and work through until your early 50s. Old age would be considered you know, early 50s to um, early 60s, and life expectancy was around 63. Uh, so it was a very short time frame, and you'd probably... Often you'd work um, longer than uh, your early to mid 50s as well. And 40 years later, in 1968, there was probably this extra phase of adolescence that you would um, uh, put in there, where um, you're potentially doing a little bit more study, whether it's university study, etc., deferring your full-time work, um, and then you'd actually work longer, and so. Uh, you'd potentially work into your early 60s, old age and uh, would be um, into your uh, 60s and then life expectancy was 71. Now, 40 years after that, so close to where we are, 2008, uh, what's happened is uh, your childhood's the same sort of time frame from your teens to 30 uh, is this adolescence type phase and I guess it's reflecting the fact that uh, children live at home longer, um, they get married later, uh, and they potentially start their careers later. Uh, so we're saying that adolescence, you know, sometimes goes up until about 30, working life uh, from 30 through till. And we're saying um, here in, in the mid-50s. And then often there's this other period, and these two, this additional yellow box is saying that people are often nowadays um, taking time out at different periods in their working careers, and whether that's to... Um, uh, yeah, take time out to do something else or whether it's travel or long service leave, uh, often there's a period here because we're working longer that we'd actually take some intentional breaks. Then this blue section here is the other interesting thing which is more about this portfolio lifestyle that I was talking about before where you might be um, 
doing a range of activities including some paid work, um, family activities or whether it's looking after grandkids or helping other um, families. Um, uh, it might be some travel and leisure. So it's more of this portfolio lifestyle, potentially also including some paid employment as well. And then old age really pushes out until your mid, mid 70s and uh, life expectancy uh, around 82. And now it's beyond that as well, particularly for women where it'd be around 87 uh, as life expectancy. I think one of the fascinating things here is a, a real case for why a super is so important is actually the, if you think about the old age pension, the government, um, pension, it hasn't changed in that time to age. Only in the past few years has it slowly crept up from 65 to 67. And if you look at that, it was introduced post the Great War and it was meant to be if you live longer than average life expectancy, then the government will kick in and because it's not expected that you will have your own savings to, once you live past average life expectancy. Whereas now you look at it where 65 falls on the graph and it's much... Um, yeah, that's right. Mm. And this is why the government, you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago was, hang on, this isn't sustainable. We need to develop this um, compulsory private savings that superannuation is. And so interesting mm. um, being that graphically shown there. Yeah, exactly. And that's what we're trying to emphasize that life expectancy is a lot longer, but you need to think about this um, phase here where you might d potentially defer retirement or stay engaged. And it has lots of uh, positive outcomes to, to maintain some paid employment. So the next question is, so that's really focusing on uh, how are you going to spend your time and what sort of um, uh, retirement are you going to um, have? Um, and what's that transition look like? Uh, and not necessarily financially there, but also um, uh, practically what are you going to do with your time? So the next question is how much will you need for retirement? And how much you need for retirement determines how much, as in how much expenditure, what you need to live on each year, and determines then how much capital or how much money you need to actually support that, which then enables you to, dis to work out when you can afford to retire. So it's really how much do you need to live on? That determines how much you need to save, which uh, determines when you can potentially afford to retire. So the first thing is how do you work out what the cost of living is in retirement? There's a few mechanisms for looking at it. One is just to assume 65% of your current income, not particularly accurate or um, useful. The other one is base it on others' experiences. So if you've got people who live a similar lifestyle to you, who have just retired, um, uh, they might have an indication of what they live on in retirement. And then the other one is to re review your expenses and estimate how they might change. So um, you might be able to go down from two cars to one car. You might have less travel uh, to work, but you have, might more have, have more leisure travel. So you can review how your expenses might change, and then that will uh, help you work out what you might need to live on in retirement. People that are budgeting all the time will be right across this. Those that don't budget well, might find it a bit more challenging. So if you're in that camp where you don't budget that well, um, ask for the Association of Super Funds Australia, do a quarterly survey of what it costs to live in retirement. And for a, a modest retirement for homeowners that are single, um, whoops, uh, it's about $27,500 to, to live a, a modest lifestyle if you're single and own your own home with no debt. For a comfortable retirement for a single person who owns their own home, it's about $43,000. And for a couple, it's about 40000 for a modest lifestyle and $60,000, $61,000 for a comfortable lifestyle. So it gives you an idea if you're not sure, and everybody's, it's sort of how long is a piece of string, everybody's different, but it gives you a bit of a gauge of what it might cost to live on in retirement. And uh, there is also on that survey a difference for those that are greater than 85. So um, it does cost a little bit less. So it might be a few thousand dollars less uh, once you're over 85, uh, potentially your medical expenses go up, but things like uh, discretionary travel or new vehicles, etc., might go down. So um, there is a slight drop there in um, uh, in your income requirement for modest and comfortable lifestyles, as per the ASFA survey. Now, if you can see this top line here, Centrelink Age Pension, as of or currently, which is from September 2018 currently provides a significant portion of, of the modest retirement. So you would only need to come up with an extra $4,000 for a single person to uh, over and above the age pension 
uh, to be able to live a modest retirement, or you might need another twenty grand if you're um, if you're wanting a comfortable retirement. So, and same with a couple, it's only about four grand over the um, um, the age pension is only um, four grand under the modest lifestyle, maybe around fifteen or sixteen thousand um, dollars under the comfortable lifestyle. So that's what you need to come up with if you're full on the full age pension, and uh, we'll touch on that a little bit more. Um, if you want to know what a comfortable retirement is and a modest retirement is, you could go to the ASFA site uh, website. So just search on ASFA retirement standards and you'll see the survey and it'll tell you what's um, uh, in and what's out in terms of modest and comfortable retirement. Um, one question we always ask in initial consultations is where, where you plan to live in retirement because often people have finished work, there's no longer the ties to um, uh, the location that they were working in that frees them up to either move to it to um, potentially a sea change tree change or a grandies change grand moving to near grandchildren or children uh, so it's a it's an important question to ask one a couple of points to make though that downsizing sometimes doesn't provide this, the financial outcomes that people anticipate because after stamp duty and selling costs and purchasing costs it actually doesn't net as much unless you're tra moving from uh, you know, uh, the city to the country, not necessarily city to um, the coast because that can just be as costly. Um, but yeah, just be wary that you don't always net a lot in a downsize, uh, particularly if you're moving to the same suburb and just an older, larger house to a smaller, newer house, you, you're, you don't get the often get the, um, the massive difference there. Uh, other things to consider with the sea change, tree change is that you sometimes... Um, can move away from family, community, and amenities, whether that's um, hospitals or um, uh, you know other facilities. Just be wary of those things because some people um, it's not as good as what you first think because you're away from your family and community and amenities. Retirement villages are great for community and support and activities, but they're really poor investments. So you make that decision to move into a retirement village for the um, uh, for the community and um, an environment, it's not for um, good investment purposes. You're generally better off owning your own home uh, than you are uh, owning or being in a retirement village from a financial perspective, but it's not the financial re reasons that you would move into a retirement village. And then granny flat rules, they can assist with um, Centrelink benefits. Uh, so a granny flat rules with Centrelink mean that you might uh, either transfer ownership of your home to your kids and then they give you a, a, a right to live in it uh, or you might be uh, building a granny flat on the back of their property or your property and uh, that can have some Centrelink benefits as well. But there's a few different, you need to answer the question where you're going to live in retirement um, because that has a, often has a large financial ramifications and impacts um, the time at which you can retire. We often like a simple approach in retirement for um, structuring your assets. We would generally advocate this type of approach where you own your own home with no debt. Um, you And I know some of you may not own your own home and um, uh, it's not always, it, it can work without owning your own home, but this is just an ideal way um, to manage things. Own your own home with no debt. Have a cash reserve of three to 12 months living expenses. So that's, um, let's say you live on 60 grand a year, so you might have, um, between fifteen and sixty thousand dollars as a cash reserve in a in a bank, um, and ideally earning some some reasonably high interest or the maximum you can get. And then generally, what we suggest for the remaining funds is in the pension phase of superannuation. Uh, it, the next webinars will go into details as to why that is. But what you can do with um, money in the pension phase of um, superannuation is that it is a tax free earnings. Uh, tax-free drawings if you're over 60 years of age. And if you've been able to clear the tax components by a strategy that, that we call a cash-out recontribution strategy that we'll talk about in future webinars, is um, that it can be tax-free to your beneficiaries as well. And it's a nice, simple way to have a regular monthly amount that comes out of the uh, pension uh, to provide for your uh, regular income requirement. So it's a simple approach, it, um, it's a tax effective approach and it's a good estate planning approach as well. So that's generally how we like to structure things. So how do you provide for your retirement? Uh, there are generally uh, three sources of income in retirement. One is your superannuation and generally you get that by moving to pension phase. You do have to trigger that yourself, it doesn't happen automatically. So some people um, say, oh, 
haven't I? Why haven't my funds moved to pension phase? You actually got to do it yourself. It's like opening a new bank account at a bank. You've got to tr tell your super fund that you need to that you're going to move from the current accumulation phase to pension phase. Uh, the second source is the government age pension if you are eligible, and there's an income and assets test that um, determines whether you're eligible after you've turned age pension age. That is, and then there's other savings or investments. Um, so um, people often say, well, how much do I need to live on? Let's say, for example, you want a comfortable retirement as a couple and you, that is $60,000 a year is what you need to live on. Uh, there is a simple rules of thumb and it, we used to say it's a 12 times rule. So if you want to live on 60 grand, then you might need um, 12 times that or $720,000 to provide for that um, 60 grand a year. And that basically assumes that you're getting 8.3% return on that money, which is your 60 grand. Now, because of low in, the low inflation over the last um, uh, decade or so, um, that 12 times rule is probably a little bit low because the, um, the returns have been lower. So if you maybe think about it being a 15, year, a 15 times rule, so to provide 60,000 of income, you might need 900 of capital uh, or, or money in, the, in super in the bank or uh, elsewhere, but this is assuming that you don't have, you're not relying on the age pension. You're just fully self-sufficient. Um, but most people, and look, the examples that we'll look at, um, uh, um, also combine some age pension, pension, so that you don't need this amount of capital to still provide the sixty thousand dollars of income uh, in retirement. So we'll we'll go into that now. And don't also don't forget, employment and business uh, are also uh, a great source of income. In retirement or transitioning to retirement as well, um, yeah, don't discount that as another source. In terms of the age pension, the eligibility age, and and people often think my retirement age is my age pension age. It's not the case. You can choose to retire before or after your age pension age. Um, it just has financial ramifications. Um, so, yeah, there's no specific age that you need to or have to retire. You can go beyond the age pension age. You can finish earlier than age pension age. Uh, but uh, the age pension age was different for men and women. So women, it used to be 60 years of age. But over time, the government slowly increased that to uh, the point that it was uh, same for men and women. And they're also slowly increasing it. So for every 18 months, um, based on your date of birth, the age pension age is increasing up to 67. Now, they have proposed in numerous occasions, but I think for... Um, political and uh, lecturer reasons, they've uh, canned uh, continuing this up to age 70. So the, the plan was to, in, in, at 18 month intervals, to increase the age pension age. So if you're born after the 1st of Jan 1957, um, 18 months after that, it would be 67 and a half. It was what it might go to, but it's currently off the agenda and it's really about, uh, I think it needs to happen based on the life expectancy that we showed, the chart that we showed you before. Um, but uh, for political reasons, they've put a hold on that. But I think it's just a matter of time before we'll need to increase the age pension age up to 70. Uh, so that's the age at which you're eligible for the pension. So you first need to reach the age pension age. And then secondly, there's an income and assets test. So for a single person, you will receive the full age pension if your income is less than $172 a fortnight. So you can earn up to a bit over four and a half grand and still receive the full age pension. Um, under the income test, uh, and from every dollar that you earn over one hundred and seventy-two dollars per fortnight as a single person, um, then the pension will reduce by fifty cents. Um, and so, um, the cutoff is so if you earn as a single person over two thousand dollars a fortnight or fifty-two thousand dollars a year you'll no longer be receive any age pension you'll come off the age pension you'll be fully self-supported uh, for a couple the figures are 304 per fortnight so it's a combined income assessment and then um, uh, yeah you'll still get the full age pension at seven seven thousand nine hundred if you earn less than 7,900 per annum. And again, reduces by 50 cents in the dollar over that $304 per fortnight figure. So even if you're earning um, uh, nearly $80,000, you can still be receiving a part age pension uh, under the income test. But there also is an asset test and you'll receive the um, age pension that is the lesser of the two tests. So if the income test 
uh, provides a lower age pension uh, payment, then you'll be income tested. If the asset test provides the lowest uh, age pension payment, then you'll be tested on the assets test. Now how the asset test work is it's different for a homeowner and a non-homeowner. So for a single homeowner, if you've got assets of less than 258,500, that's the current threshold and it indexes up each uh, March and September, uh, then you'll receive the full age pension. Uh, but you'll receive no age pension if your uh, assets exceed 564,000. We'll go into this in a lot more detail in, in the coming webinars. I think we've got a series of five that we're going to do. Uh, webinar four and five are really focused on Centrelink. We'll go into it in a lot more detail. So if for a couple, uh, if you have assets less than 387,500 and you're a homeowner, uh, then uh, you receive the full age pension and then you'll get no pension if you've got 848,000 of assets. And your assets include your, um, uh, exclude your home and generally inc include most other assets. So super, shares, um, cash in the bank, cars, um, all other assets. So let's look at an example. So your sources of income are your superannuation, um, the age pension, and uh, any other investments that you might have. We've got, and, and the purpose of going, I know some people don't like charts, but it's just to give you some examples of uh, how much you might need to live on in retirement. And so we've got Joe and Mary, they're both 66 years of age, they're retired, they own their own home with no debt. Um, and they're wanting to live on what we call a modest retirement, so $40,000. Um, and they've got $170,000 in super. Now the average super balance for somebody um, retiring uh, a number of years ago was $120,000. So we're saying Joe has $120,000, Mary's got fifty dollars in super, and their return is 5%. And that's generally what a balanced fund has done uh, over the last few years. So we assume that level of return. And any surplus funds, they've just saved into the bank. Now, just to explain this chart, um, the red line is the $40,000 being indexed up with inflation. So that's just going up with um the CPI, Consumer Price Index, or as prices go up, you need more to live on. The green lines of what you've actually achieved, so the green lines here being larger than the, or taller than the red line means that you've actually got surplus income each year. Uh, and then the assets at the back, which is made up of the 170,000 superannuation up here, it continues to grow over time because you're spending less than you're earning and your assets to continue to build. And the reason for that is if we go to the next chart, it's because the age pension, this um, aquary type color, um, it provides most of the required $40,000 and then the superannuation pension just tops that up over the $40,000 income requirement. Over time, what that means is they end up um, needing to save some money into the um, uh, uh, bank because you can't get into super at that point in time. And uh, so you end up having some uh, investment income uh, outside of super as well. Now the same sort of thing happens for a single person as well. So the modest retirement for um, a single person, I'm just saying this is Mary who's single, um, she's 66 retired, owns a home with no mortgage and she's going to live the modest retirement of 28,000 per annum and she's got 120 in the bank earning 5.2% uh, return. Very similar set outcome to the previous previous scenario with Joe and Mary, uh, but she's a single person this time uh, and she's spending less than she earns, so her $120,000 in superannuation assets grows over time to when she's 94, it might be uh, nearly worth $300,000 at that point. Um, so that's a great scenario, but you might be saying to yourself, well, I don't really want to live on the modest, re on the modest um, retirement lifestyle. And so if you want to live on the um, comfortable retirement lifestyle, that's $60,000. I think she actually pushed up to 61, but I've just stuck it at 60 for round figures. Um, and this is Joe and Mary again, and they're still only got the $170,000 of super to live on. And if they're living on 60 grand, they're 170,000 because the age, um, uh, the age pension is only providing, uh, I think it was around $34,000 then they need to come up with uh, another $26,000 from their own savings. And uh, their 170 grand in super isn't going to um, provide $26,000 of return, so they're going to eat into their capital. They're going to eat into their 170,000 in their super. 
and they'll eat into that until they're 74 or 75 and then they will have used up all their super and then there's a shortfall. So there's this gap here, this white section here, means that they're not achieving their um, retirement goal of $60,000 per annum. They're now fully reliant on the age pension of about $34,000 uh, per annum. And that's where you can see there's a gap. So, And similarly, uh, the same sort of example for uh, Mary, if she was whoops, uh, single, um, uh, just gone back too far. So that's example two, two B. So Mary, if she's uh, single, um, similar thing. She might have one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, but because it's not providing the income that she needs for a comfortable retirement, she'll eat into her assets pretty quickly. And at age seventy four, uh, she'll run out of funds, and there'll be a shortfall. She'll be from seventy five. She'll be fully reliant on the age pension, which was around twenty four thousand dollars, not the forty three thousand dollars of of what she needs to live on. It's actually five point two percent return is what we've assumed here. I just have an update of the slide. Um, so that's the scenario. So then, well, you'll ask the question, well, if I want to live the comfortable retirement, um, how much do I need to provide for that comfortable retirement? So we've got an example here where uh, Joe and Mary now, instead of having $170,000 of assets, they now have got $400,000 in assets to provide their $60,000 of income. So they start with um, a four hundred, dollars um, and they eat into that over time, but because their $400,000 is earning um, you know, 5% or $20,000, it's close to what their income requirement is, and so they're only eating into their capital by about $6,000 a year, which means that they're, um, they're able to support their $60,000 lifestyle or income requirement uh, through until uh, past 100 years of age. So and this is a straight line return. So we're just assuming 5% straight line. It's not showing sort of all the ups and downs in the market, which can have an impact. Um, but uh, it shows that you don't need the, um, I can't remember the figures that I talked about at the start, but if you're living on your own resources, I think we talked about uh, $720,000 or $900,000 to provide for a comfortable retirement. But when you include the age pension in the equation, you, you can, um, uh, survive on a lot less because the age pension provides for a significant portion of your income requirement. Similar sort of scenario for uh, uh, Mary if she's single, wanting a comfortable single retirement of $43,000. Um, it's actually $300,000, not $450,000, but it's a 5.2% return. I think there's an um, uh, issue with some of the versions that I've got here. But um, similar again, Mary can have $300,000 and that'll provide until for her th comfortable retirement until she's about 91 and then she'll have a shortfall. Now if, if Mary still only had $300,000 but wanted a comfortable retirement, another thing she could potentially do is take a bit more risk than the 5.2% um, uh, return that we um, had modeled in the previous scenarios. So she could potentially, rather than being in the balanced option, she might go into a growth option and take a bit more risk with the idea that she might get a bit higher level of return. And so we've kept everything the same, $300,000 of, um, uh, of assets, comfortable retirement of 43,000 expenditure, but we've increased the risk in the portfolio and assume that that has achieved a higher level of return of 6%. And that pushes her, um, investments or makes them last longer by about another four or five years um, so that it lasts a bit longer. So how much you need in retirement is a combination of what you need to live on, uh, what your capital is and what the return is on that capital. Um, so that's what you, you, you need to think through if you're trying to work out well when can I retire as, but the key factor is how much do you need to live on and from that that's a great starting point uh, to then work out the other numbers and work out the other figures. How are we going? Any questions at all? I'm keep um, uh, looking at uh, the chat section so if you do have questions do, do let us know. Uh, that just one um, other example to cover off this whole suite of, of um, examples. Some people say, well, what if I want to retire um, 10 years before the age pension or 10 years before I'm eligible for the age pension? Well, in that case, we've got 
um, an example of Joe and Mary in this case being 57 years of age. They've decided to retire, so um, their age pension age will be 67. They've re decided to retire um, 10 years earlier than their um, eligibility for the age pension, which means that they're going to need a, a lot more capital than if they um, retired at age pension age because they're fully reliant on their own resources. So they own their own home, no debt. They want to live on a, a comfortable retirement of $60,000 per annum. But this time, they need a bit more capital. So I'm assuming that they've got $400,000 each in super and we're going to keep it at the higher 6% level of return. If they've got $800,000 when they retire at 57, they'll eat into their resources. So their um, $800,000 by the time they reach age pension age at 67 will be worth less than $500,000 because they've basically used that $300,000 to live on um, uh, over that 10-year period. And then they become eligible for the age pension and then they, they eat into less of their resources over that time because the age pension kicks in. So it shows here how that if you retire earlier than age pension age and are fully reliant on your own resources, it does have a significant impact on your retirement savings because there's no age pension to supplement. A, a, a good approach to mitigate that is to have some part-time employment, which um, means that it's sort of mimicking the age pension uh, by uh, supplementing some employment income uh, with your investment income. So there's a few examples. Now hopefully you've gauged from that where you might sit in that equation and give you a sense of what uh, you might be able to achieve um, and when you think you might need to retire or how long your retirement savings might last and, and therefore that can f um, filter into um, uh, you know, your investment options and how you might structure your, your assets in retirement. Uh, so Lois has just asked, so super is part of our asset, assets? Yes, so um, the, blue, the blue line here at the back in each of the examples is your assets excluding your home. So it's basically saying all your cash, um, super, um, any other investments, term deposits, shares, etc. would form part of your assets there that you're using to live on. Yeah. Uh, what's excluded here is your home. Yeah. Any other questions before I continue to move on? Andrew, can you have too much capital? Um, the thing about having too much capital is, and I haven't shown an example here, but uh, if you have uh, assets over the $848,000, you'll, you'll get no age pension. So um, you haven't got too much money, but you've got too much money for the to be eligible for the age pension. But that will just generally mean that um, you'll be fully reliant on your own resources. And then once you've used your resources and your assets fall below the threshold, then you'll get some pension at that point in time. So I don't think there's necessarily having too much capital though um, what most people try to target is um, you can't take it with you so ideally if you knew when you were going to die you would sort of use all your resources whether that's giving it away or spending it etc by the time that you you, you passed away um, but obviously we don't know when that's going to be generally good question now fire through any other questions as we um, uh, continue through and I know we're about 20 seconds off your bedtime Andrew so hopefully um, we can quickly wrap up this last bit. Um, uh, so how to prepare for retirement. So we talked about what your um, requirements for retirement uh, are so uh, we've talked through that. What can you do to prepare yourself for retirement? So as I mentioned earlier, think about both the financial and personal lifestyle matters. What are you going to do with your time? How are you going to stay engaged in, in community and life um, post-retirement? And, and as I mentioned earlier, particularly for blokes going from full time to um, full retire full time work to full time retirement. Uh, so what are you going to do with your time? Uh, then these other steps are basically what anybody can do at any stage of life: pay off uh, debt, um, uh, can, particularly consumer debt. Uh, have an emergency fund, that's generally three to six months living expenses. In retirement, we push that to three to 12 months living expenses. It's just good to have that extra buffer. Save for major purchases, which generally include buying a home, buying a car, education, or starting a business. They're your four major purchases that we're, we're talking about there. Then you focus on paying off your mortgage, um, and then build your retirement savings, and then take advantage of tax saving and asset building strategies. Um, now, we won't go into those in a lot of detail but because they'll form the basis of the next webinars, but some of the strategies that, are the, that you can apply that actually work really well are 
um, a, uh, purchasing a home or investment property, uh, that's definitely a good uh, thing to pursue. Um, government co-contribution, little little strategy, but it works really well if you're eligible. Put a thousand into super, get five in the back. Eligible spouse contribution, put three thousand into your spouse's super and get five forty tax rebate if you, if you're eligible for it. Salary sacrifice is still by one of the by by and far one of the, the best tax saving strategies. Although I have just seen a memo from a um, an institution saying that lay, one of Labor's policies is to um, not ban salary sacrifice but ban personal deductible contributions, which is very um, similar to um, salary sacrifice. So I'm, I don't, haven't actually checked whether that is the policy, but that was some of the advice from an institution that gave us some of um, Labor's um, uh, policies going to the, the election. Uh, transition to retirement. So some of the benefits of that have been uh, pegged back, but there still are some great um, benefits of that strategy. But one of the significant parts of that strategy is the salary sacrifice strategy, uh, but still, still worthwhile doing in many cases. Uh, deductible contributions to offset capital gains tax, that's sort of like the salary sacrifice, which means uh, saving income tax by putting money into super. Downsize a contribution, if you own your house for 10 years you can, and you're over 65, you can put in a, a, a contribution of up to $300,000 each uh, into super. It's another way to um, help boost your retirement savings. Cash out recontribution strategy we mentioned earlier. It doesn't really help couples as per se, but it helps um, provide for your beneficiaries. And then small business CGT concessions, another strategy that can apply for business owners who are selling their business. But if you, there, there's some of the strategies that we um, focus on. Uh, there are lots of other strategies, and then we've got Centrelink strategies that we'll talk about in in seminars uh, or webinars uh, four and five as well. So they're the types of strategies that, that we look at that we'll discuss in the next webinars. Um, we've got further resources. Uh, we'll email the webinar recording to you. Um, the next webinar, webinar is how to transition to retirement. So that's, that's a good one if you're in that pre-retirement, uh, so the imagination, hesitation, anticipation type phase. Uh, really worthwhile uh, tapping into that one. Uh, you can get personal advice through us either by the website or calling and then Christian Super's website um, and uh, phone number are there as well. There is also, in terms of advice, there also is um, uh, some robo type advice that you, can That's access, right. yeah. that you can access via your member logins um, and you can also call the help desk and you can get some uh, verbal over the, uh, over the phone advice as well so they're good points to start and if you want to know more about Centrelink um, uh, you know without going to a financial advisor you can speak to their financial information services officer um, and that's free advice by their sort of financial planners that can that can help you as well uh, so there's some good sources of information sorry um, Nathan were you going to uh, touch on something as well Oh, I was just just repeating that the um, about the advice within within super um, yeah the there's a self serve advice that you can get via the member online portal or you can call the contact center and get advice and that is advice on um, there are advice on other things like how much insurance should I have or what investment option within Christian super should I be in but there is also advice on how much should I start contributing. Um, to build up to the right sort of retirement outcome that I want. Um, so a way, but that's very, it's what we call intra fund advice. So it's only considering super. It's not looking at the full range of things that Gavin was just talking about. Um, so they're good, often good first steps to give you sort of a taste of what advice can look like. It's free. We uh, provide that to all members. And then um, if that was helpful and you feel like you want more help on your uh, your home and paying whether you should pay down your mortgage or moving into a retirement living arrangement, then you can talk. We can put you through to Gavin or other financial planners, uh, Christian financial planners, who can help you with a deeper understanding there. Um, before you finish, Gavin, the, there is also a few questions in the questions and answers section as opposed to the chat section that you haven't looked at, I think. Um, uh, Janet and Phil. I think I've covered them off. If um, Okay. Yeah. About inheritance, was it? If you in, 
inherit some money? What's the best thing to be done with this? Uh, I haven't seen that one. Oh, Q&A. Is that different to the Q&A, chat Q&A. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, sorry. Yeah, got gotcha. you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, sorry, <laughs> Jeanette, that I didn't answer your question earlier. I wasn't looking at the... Um, so, we've got, if you inherit some money, what is the what is best to be done with this? Oh, it's really hard to answer specifically. <laughs> Often, based on that... Um, uh, if I go back to the... Um, you know, the simple, easy mechanism for structuring uh, your finances, often it is good to be able to put it into super and roll it to pension phase, but it depends on your eligibility to get it into super. So are you over or under 65 years of age? Um, there's a contribution limit of $100,000 a year for what we call non-concessional. That was another um, uh, policy that, that I found that, Labor had was that they were thinking of reducing that to seventy five thousand dollars from one hundred thousand dollars. So there's a number of strategies there that, or, or policies that that, that Labor have that are going to really pull in some of these the flexibility with super. Um, it's not just about um, franking credits that uh, they're proposing into the election. Yeah, so I, I don't really you can't really without knowing your full circumstances. Um, uh, Jeanette, know what the best best solution for for you is, but. Uh, if you pay down debt first, um, uh, then putting it into super often is a good um, approach to take. But you might learn more about that in the uh, next webinars as well, because we talk about the tax, the different uh, tax rates in different entities. So um, investing in your own name versus investing in the accumulation phase of super versus the pension phase of super. Yeah, hope that's answered it to a to a degree though. Um, and then we've got Phil who says, can you make the slides available, please? Yeah, sure, Phil. Uh, so I'll make the slides available and, um, and a recording of the video as well. So you'll get both of those. So no problem at all. Uh, any other questions? Uh, also, we've got David. Are the graphs that you showed available so I can test my own situation? The graphs... Um, they're just static graphs, so you can have the slides, but you, you can't input your own data. Uh, so um, best, best use for that, David, is the online tool. So if you look for Christian Super Equip in your online portal, uh, I think you, by memory you've got to go to the uh, correspondence tab, and then there's a link to Christian Super Equip in there, and you actually have interactive graphs like that that you can change assumptions on and um, be able to see what it looks like if you were to make other contributions or um, limit your drawdown amounts and things like that. Yeah. Um, last time I tested it, which was a while ago, it didn't include the age pension. I, I think you've, it's now including it in those projections, is it? No. Uh, yeah, it had an update. It had an update at the start of last year. Yeah. Um, okay. to fix that. Um, so it's now there. So that would be a good place to start to so go on log on to your member login put in all your, all your details and then see what it looks like um yeah so yeah as soon as you log in you should see or a bit like an advertising tile that says christian super equip um and that christian super equip is the self-serve advice that's good oh it's good that we've so uh because david's in adelaide we've got an extra uh, half an hour, so he doesn't have to get to bed Andrew, until yeah. quarter to ten our time. So that's good. We've got a bit of time. He's, he's still up and about. Uh, <laughs> any other questions before we uh, wrap up? I know it is getting late, particularly in the eastern uh, states. Oh, sorry, Graham says, if you get an inheritance, how much can you give away? You can give away as much as you like, um, uh, Graham and Lorraine. Uh, it just does have some Centrelink implications if you are eligible for the pension. So. Um, if you give over ten thousand dollars a year or thirty thousand dollars over five years, then Centrelink will consider it an asset um, for for five years. Um, the, the amount so, of those thresholds, as, as, as though you never gave it away, in some sense. Exactly. Or, yeah. Until you get to the right. Yeah. But if you are five years prior to being age pension age, then it's going to have no impact. It, it will have come off your assessment by the time you've hit age pension age, or Depending on how much you want to gift, um, uh, you can stay under the limits. Um, yeah, so there's, or if you're not eligible for the age pension either because of your age or your assets, then it doesn't matter how much you gift anyway. Mm. Yeah. 
Um, thanks, Valerie. Uh, you're welcome, Valerie. Glad you enjoyed the content. Um, Andrew, did you say when the next webinars are going to be held? Uh, yeah, I've got them all planned, but I'll include them in the email uh, summary out to you. And uh, I think you'll get an invite via Christian Super as well. So we'll get you that, that information and the recordings. Um, any other questions before we wrap up? No. Anything you wanted to cover off with, Nath, that I might have raised um, during oh, the no. session? Um, uh, no, I think, I think that was really helpful. And it, I, it, it's good to get the feedback from you guys that you're enjoying it. I'm glad we've put it, brought back the webinars and so look forward to doing the next one. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for your feedback, Andrew and Glenda. Any um, negative feedback that, or any, um, what do you call it, constructive criticism that can help to um, make the next one better? If you've got any comments there, then feel free to provide them as well. Um. Uh, very helpful. Thanks, David and Glenda. Um, no worries. Uh, it seems like uh, Jeanette, thanks. No worries, Jeanette. Uh, yeah. David's showing that he's in Adelaide when he's in Sydney. I'm not sure why that is. Oh, no, no, no. I think um, you got confused between Andrew and David. Oh, sorry, uh, David. I was talking about Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I confused you both. <laughs> it's day. Yeah, sorry. It's just. <laughs> <laughs> um. Thanks for being on board, everyone. Uh, we might wrap up. Um, th thanks again for being with us and hopefully uh, see you next webinar. Good night. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.